Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey everyone, Brian Zane here. Well, this week our old friend Big Hoss McGraw is out. He told me he was looking for a guy named... The Mori? Anyway, this week's classic pay-per-view is Anarchy Rules 99. So in honor of that, what better way to stick it to the man than with Surfshark VPN? Surfshark gives you the freedom to surf your World Wide Web the way you want. With thousands of servers, you can basically teleport to anywhere in the world and get access to websites, YouTube videos, and streaming libraries you might not normally get. For example, this past week, a whole lot of my videos suddenly got blocked in these countries. So if you live in one of these countries, you can go to Surfshark, change your location of where your internet's at, and then you can watch my videos again. Isn't that great? Then when you throw in their private data encryption and other safeguards against malware, hackers, and other ne'er-do-wells, why not go with Surfshark? Support the channel by downloading it in the description. Use the code REGRET and get 83% off your order, plus an extra three months for free. Well, I've said my piece, folks. Thanks for watching and enjoy this week's review. How did you find my room? No time to explain, kid. I finally cracked it. I found where the mauve is and I've got him in my sights. Grab your pilly gimmick, kids. We're gonna get him next Wednesday. Oh, well, that sounds like... like plenty of time to explain. This week we go back to the land of extreme, ECW in 1999, arguably their hottest year in operation. And if you've been following along with the Invasion storyline I've been covering for the last couple of months, you're going to see some familiar faces on this show. It's ECW Anarchy Rules with a Z, 1999, from September 19th at the Odium Expo Center in Villa Park, Illinois, known here as Chicago, Illinois. ECW is in a very interesting transition phase right now because some big stars are leaving the company, others are returning to the company all while they're finally getting this big TV deal on cable, ECW on TNN, the Nashville Network. And you know, I think only good things are gonna come from that deal. This show was nominated by Kyle McVicker and Mike Fangman over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. 6,000 folks in attendance makes this the largest ECW crowd in history. 85,000 pay-per-view buys for the inaugural Anarchy Rules, their second most purchased show of the year behind Heatwave in July. The show opens and we see Masato Tanaka pull up to the arena when Steve Prezak, not to be confused for Dave Prezak with different spelling, tries to get a word from him about the title match. Then Judge Jeff Jones rolls up behind them, complains about Tanaka being in his way. Tanaka Tanaka beats him up and leaves. Judge Jeff then warns that Tanaka's punishment will be awesome. We then go to the ring where Joey Styles and Cyrus the Virus from the network, they welcome fans to the show. Then we go to our first match here as Lance Storm with Dawn Marie takes on the new effing show, Jerry Lynn. Dawn is billed here as Lance Storm's personal bitch, which that threw me for a loop. I forgot that she was billed as that. Seems kind of out of character for someone as straight-laced as Lance. He doesn't seem the kind of person who would have bitches. Meanwhile, Jerry Lynn's been having a hell of a 90. His wars with Rob Van Dam this year really made him the stuff of legend. The last time those two fought, the Impact players beat both them up and ruined the match, which brings us here. And the story with Lynn here is he is so obsessed with trying to unseat RVD as the World TV Champion. He's just going and going. He takes no time to rest, so he's more prone to injury. And that last beatdown with the Impact players hurt his ribs. The match starts out and we get the graps. Lynn with a triangle dropkick to Storm and they fight on the outside. Back in the ring, some more back and forth. Storm drops Lynn chest first into the ropes and begins to take over. Over. Lance in a nice handspring clothesline in the corner. He mule kicks Lynn right in the dick at one point, who then ejects Storm and dives onto him, then gives her a seat with a super dick kick city. A series of roll up counters, all ending with the German suplex and a bridge by JL. Hot damn the athleticism. Chairs are brought into the ring. Lynn counters a powerbomb attempt into a DDT on one of them. Goes to the cover, but then Dawn Marie puts Lance's foot on the ropes. We get the Irish whip. Lynn dodges the chair in the corner, but checks into the ring post instead. Kind of a surprising finish here, where Storm just knees Jerry and the injured ribs, Lynn collapses, Storm rolls him up and wins. I give it four stars out of five, a hell of an opening match to really set the tone and set the bar for the rest of this event. I mean, it's a great technical matchup here. There's a little bit of the, uh, extra violence with the chairs and stuff, but it all plays into the story. I think the way they told that with Jerry's rib injury and the finish and how it played into that, I thought it was really well done. So yeah, fantastic match with a very cool finish. Joey and Cyrus bicker for a bit as they do all show when Simon Diamond appears making his pay-per-view debut. He declares he's got a problem. Simon says Simon needs a tag team partner 
Center. He appears to pick out Tom Marquez, recent graduate of the House of Hardcore. He's working the bell tonight, but ah, uh, uh, he didn't say Simon Says. He says no man would be his tag team partner, but what about a lady? It's Jazz. She says she wants to prove herself, but Simon says that all women have done in wrestling is prove that they're worthless. Jazz goes after him, so then he tells Tom Marquez to get her, Simon does say, and he does it. Just jumps her in the ring, and we have a match, apparently. Marquez was the first attack, but he falls victim to a testicular claw. Jazz hits the Jazz Stinger. Great name for a finish, by the way. But then Diamond and Tony DeVito storm the ring and start beating her up. In come Nova and Chris Chetty to make the save. They've been teaming with Jazz as of late. Nova and Chetty are all over these guys, but Chetty appears to hurt his ankle or his knee when he jumps over Simon for that moonsault, and now he is out for the rest of this thing. So this is the tag team match that Diamond alluded to at the top of the segment, but now one half of his opponents are already out of the equation. Nova's hit with a low blow by DeVito, and the baddies work him over. Medical staff checks on Chetty on the outside. DeVito and Nova go for something, but it doesn't quite work, and of course the ECW crowd's pretty unforgiving. Suddenly out come Danny Doring and Roadkill, along with Miss Congeniality, the future Lita. They jump everyone in the ring, heels and baby faces. The heart attack on Jazz. Roadkill looks to squish Jazz, but then the rest of the roster go to make the save, including the future Big Vito from WCW and WWE. Turns into a big brawl, but then Natural Born Killers blast over the speakers and New Jack comes to the ring with his plunder. He cleans house with a street sign, a computer keyboard, and so forth. Vito gets hit in the dick. There's a staple gun, a guitar, and that's a New Jack segment. I'm going to include everything here from the beginning of Simon Diamond's promo to the end with New Jack. It was a five-star clusterfuck, but unfortunately it just translates to one actual star. I don't make the rules. I'm sorry. Also, it sucks that Chris Chetty got hurt in that very opening salvo he did. Well, for weeks now we've seen the feud between Tajiri and Super Crazy play out, and now they've thrown little Guido into the mix for the international three-way dance here. It's just one of the many chapters in their illustrious series of three-way dances here. Uh, Tajiri's been on a roll for the last few months in ECW, basically established himself as a top contender for any championship, in Joey Styles' words, even challenged for Taz's world title in recent weeks. The action is fast and furious to start. I like Tajiri grabbing Guido by the legs and just shoving him out of the ring and onto the ramp. Dives from Crazy, then from Guido. Guido has Super Crazy in a camel clutch. Tajiri with a drop kick to Super Crazy's face, then to Guido's. Crazy and Guido fight on the outside. Tajiri drop kicks Crazy over the barricade. Acai moonsault onto both opponents. Big Sal in the ring now and hits Tajiri with a big slam. Giant power bomb to Crazy as you fat fuck chance fill the arena. Super Crazy with an Acai moonsault of his own. Sal knocked off the apron and he flies through a table on the outside. Very pretty tarantula by Tajiri. We've got a camel clutch Sicilian crab combo on Tajiri. A tree of woe on Guido. He dodges one attack but not the other. A moonsault by Crazy and Guido's eliminated down to Super Crazy and Tajiri. Super Crazy with the Diaz count punches. <laughs> Ty Jerry with a big DDT to create some breathing room between them, then an inverted tornado DDT off the ropes by Super Crazy in response. Super Crazy hits a first rope moonsault but can't even get to number two. To Jerry hits the kick, the drop kick, the brain buster, the win. I also give this match four stars out of five. Pretty much any time these three wrestled each other, it was magic. And I'm pretty sure if this is not the first three-way dance with them, it's one of the first, and these guys do a great job. And really, it's this kind of style, and it's really super crazy, and Tajiri, who really helped kind of keep ECW, at least the mid-card of it, very strong during 99, during all this flux with talent coming and going in the company. I, I do remember watching when ECW was first on TNN early on, and seeing these guys and being really blown away by what they could do. And so it's just really cool that you can see them on display here showing what the best of what they can do in this match We then hear from Steve Carino backstage who's accompanied by his rookie monster Rhino and Jack Victory He talks about the mystery tag team He wanted to have face dreamer and Raven for the tag titles his first choice was apparently the insane clown posse But he says at the 11th hour ICP management pulled them from the show because they didn't want to lose Which you know the juggalo in me then as a teenager and even now is a bit disappointed in hearing that we find out as far as the replacements go Carino says the replacements will be Rhino and himself. Future NWA owner Billy Corgan's at ringside. Joey and Cyrus talk about the ICP not showing up. Cyrus says they had more heat in the WWF than he did, and Joey says that's some heat. Up next, Just Incredible, who's accompanied by Jason, takes on Sabu in his return to ECW pay-per-view. Now, Sabu has been gone for a while. He was banned from ECW for several months by the Impact players doing some legal wrangling on account of him being too violent and dangerous. But now the ban has been lifted, and Just Incredible must now lie in the bed that he made. But then Justin pulls out a restraining order to prevent Sabu from coming to the ring, so he wants to win by forfeit. But the referee says even though it is a legally binding document, as the title 
title of the show says, Anarchy Does Rule. Credible Dex the Ring announcer with his cane and beats him down. The lights cut out. They come back up and Sabu has appeared and the match is on. Sabu on the attack. Dinks Justin with a chair on the outside. Fight it on the ramp and a table's been set up. Credible dives off the top and splashes Sabu through the table. Nice slingshot kick off the ropes by Boo. The action spills over the barricade and Sabu with a springboard flipping dive into the crowd. Bill Alfonso helps Sabu set up another table bridge. Justin gets out of the way, but not for long. Sabu repeatedly jumps off the rope and tries to break the table and Justin. Justin now bleeding as Sabu keeps working him over. Jason distracts and that allows Justin to hit a super kick to regain the advantage. Another table set up in the corner. Justin whacks a broken Singapore cane over Boo's head. They set up a table in the corner and JC goes for some kind of attack, but really he takes the entire bump of the table. Sabu gets none of it. Sabu counters out of the pinfall by just hitting Credible with part of the table. Love it. That's incredible attempted. Sabu reverses. Jason interferes. Fonzie with a damn sidekick of his own to Jason. Justin hits the pile driver, but Sabu kicks out. They do it again. More reversals. And this time, Justin hits it on the chair for the win. I give this one three stars out of five. I think this is a good performance by both guys. They took some, some big risks, and the match was brutal, but in a good way, not necessarily a bad way. I feel bad because I feel I've been kind of trained to believe, that, oh, everything Sabu did was a botch. You know, thank you, Matthew, for, for rewiring my brain like that. But it feels like every time I've seen a Sabu match on uh, the Classic Review segment, I'm generally surprised that, wow, there were no real screw-ups in these. On we go to the ECW World Title Match, as Taz, who has one foot out the door, defends against Masato Tanaka who is the current FMW world champion. So the word got out about a week or two before this show that Taz was leaving ECW once his contract expired to go for the greener pastures of the World Wrestling Federation. And so naturally, the ECW faithful were very upset by that. I mean, they just lost the Dudley Boys not too long before this. And so the big one-two punch of losing the Dudley Boys and Taz in a very relatively short amount of time seems very frustrating. And I can definitely sympathize with the ECW fans for that. They're very conflicted in this match. They don't know what to to do really because Taz gets the streamer treatment for his entrance but he also gets a you sold out chant very conflicting here before the match can begin though there's commotion in the crowd Taz calls somebody out it's Mike Awesome who's the longtime rival of Tanaka and it's his first ECW appearance in a year since a knee injury so this was the punishment Jeff Jones was talking about at the top of the show he wants a piece of the action and Taz wants him in as well he screams at Paul Heyman on the outside to make it happen so Paulie makes it a three-way dance Awesome and Tanaka work over the champion and Taz is quick eliminated with the Roaring Elbow Awesome Splash Combo and is no longer the ECW Champion. A big old Fuck You Taz chant breaks out as the rest of the locker room comes out to watch the proceedings. Awesome with a big dive to Tanaka on the outside and a top rope clothesline inside. Tanaka runs all the way up the ramp, then back down with a chair. Tornado DDT on the ramp. Tanaka with a diving chair attack onto another chair. Awesome is able to fight out of everything and is able to hit an Awesome Bomb outside and onto a table. The Spine Buster and the Awesome Splash. Tanaka kicks out. Awesome repeatedly dinking Tanaka with the chair, but Tanaka keeps fighting back. Tanaka hits the diamond dust, but can't follow up with a pin in time. Awesome ducks the roaring elbow, hits a German and a spear, another kick out. There's more chair shots by Awesome, sets up a table. Tanaka wants to go for a superplex, but Mike blocks it. A top rope powerbomb through the table, and Awesome wins and is the new ECW champion. Taz returns to the ring and hands off the belt, gives him the rub, very respectful. He's going out the right way here, says farewell to the ECW fans, and the locker room, and the fans finally chant some positive stuff for Taz, but then he tells him to chant for Awesome instead. Very classy move here. I give this match four stars. I really like this thing from beginning to end of the segment. Just the story they told, from Awesome crashing the proceedings and getting involved in the matchup to the rapid-fire elimination of Taz, so it's like a new champion is guaranteed. Like Everyone knew that Taz is going to lose the belt on his way out, but I don't think anyone expected it was going to be done in that way, which is a big surprise. Then Awesome going on to win the belt and kind of open this new era after a great match, between Awesome and Tanaka, who always have great wars to watch. They're always very entertaining and always fun to watch in kind of a car crash kind of way. And so again, for Awesome to win and uh, maybe presumably usher in this new era was a really cool moment. But of course, as we all know, the Awesome era in ECW is relatively short-lived. Well, speaking of big departures, a few weeks ago, the Dudley boys were on their way out of the company and threatened to take the tag team championships with them to the WWF. Spike Dudley and Balls Mahoney briefly took the belts from them, but Bubba and Devon got them back right away. On the first episode of ECW on TNN, the Dudleys call out Tommy Dreamer, who's not wrestling, he's got an injured
Richard back, and they challenge him to take the belts from them. And when all hope is lost, Raven appears after having jumped ship from WCW to help his blood rival win the belts, another form of psychological torture by Raven. We then hear Raven with one of his famous playground promos. He talks about his long and twisted history with Dreamer, how since he left ECW, Dreamer has lost his focus, lost his killer instinct, lost his girl, and now that he's back, he's going to be Dreamer's own personal demon. Back to the ring we go. Joel Gertner interrupts the ring announcer to interview Francine and Tommy Dreamer. So to recap, Dreamer is working with a bad back, and the question that's being posed in storyline is, should Dreamer relinquish his half of the tag team championship and let down the fans and give Raven the satisfaction, or will Will he work through the pain and just possibly risk even further injury and probably not be getting paid while he's doing it? Wow, what a choice. Dreamer is asked about his condition and his future. He starts off by saying he just went to the Cubs game yesterday and saw Sammy Sosa hit home run number 60. Cyrus the Great comeback saying, who the hell cares? Tommy's tired of doctors telling him what to do. He needs to sweat, bleed, and innovate some violence in Chicago. Out come Steve Carino, Rhino, and Jack Victory. Carino's had enough. Six Rhino on Dreamer and they has fight. Dreamer takes the wheelchair-bound Victory and hurls him toward Francine, who decks him with a chair. We get a spine buster and a kick out. Carino brings a ladder into the equation, but that backfires on him. Francine involved again, and this time Rhino slams her. Raven appears, hits the DDT on Rhino. We have a brawl with everyone here. Stereo DDTs. Dreamer and Raven win this very short match. Suddenly, we see Man Cow, the famous Chicago-based radio personality, and two fat guys with no shirts on behind him standing on the ramp, and they leave with Raven. Okay, then. I give it a half star out of five. Like, if this match is short the way it was to protect Dreamer from further injury, then why did you still have him take all the bumps? Because between he and Raven, Dreamer was doing the lion's share of actual bumping in this matchup here. Um, this was just more of kind of a prolonged promo segment with a match in between. Kind of similar, I guess, to everything we saw earlier with Simon Diamond and Chris Chetty and Nova and everybody else and New Jack and whatnot. But this one had a bit better structure and it was more about the story with Tommy and Raven. Axel Rotten appears in the ring. He's calling out Mike Awesome for a title match, but we get the Impact players and Johnny Smith instead. Johnny is a UK wrestling legend, and he's here on a bit of a loop with ECW for the next couple of months, and he's scheduled to face Rob Van Dam for the TV title in the main event of the show, but it's weird because I'm watching the TV shows leading up to the pay-per-view here, and I don't hear Johnny Smith's name mentioned like once in the promotion, so I don't know when they advertise this. Storm tells Axel to rescind the challenge before they do it for him. Axel strikes first, but he gets mugged by the others. In come Balls Mahoney and Spike Dudley for the save. Spike goes to the acid drop on Jason, but Don Marie gets in the way, so she takes the move instead. Balls dinks Smith with a chair, and Rob Van Dam's challenger is now laid out. Axel wants RVD to come out now to take on Balls instead and prove he's the whole effing show. So that's how we get the main event of this pay-per-view is a bait and switch from a match that me personally, I didn't feel was promoted enough to begin with. Now the last time we saw RVD on ECW here, he had just begun his historic reign as TV champion. Here he's about 18 months in. Balls, the deceptively skilled wrestler, gets the advantage early on when he suplexes Rob a couple of times. RVD responds with a sidekick off the top and a big crossbody. Fight on the outside. RVD tries a moonsault off the barricade. Balls catches him but can't capitalize. Fonzie tries to set Balls up for the Van Daminator, but Mahoney sees it coming, then stops for a refreshing beverage. Balls seems to have an answer for everything Rob's doing early on. Hits the damnedest spinning heel kick over the top rope I've ever seen. Back outside, Rob does hit the Van Daminator, then a huge-ass plancha off the top and to the outside. Back in the ring, Mahoney hits the New Jersey Jam, that second rope leg drop, but there's a kick out. He mocks RVD and hits his own frog splash. Man, look at Balls go in this match. RVD comes back, hits the rolling thunder on the chair, wants to go for a monkey flip, but Balls counters the power bomb. a DDT on the chair moments later. Balls ducks another Van Daminator and dinks Rob, goes to the cover, but Fonzie breaks up the pin, then throws a chair at Balls, who no-sells it. Styles says, Bill Alfonso is going to die. Swing and a miss. Balls turns around, takes a top rope Van Daminator, the five-star frog splash. Mr. Pay-Per-View wins yet again, and we get sportsmanship to close out the show. I give it three stars out of five. You know, this was not the cleanest match in the world. I think it was a bit Van Daminator heavy almost, but I was very pleasantly surprised as to how good the back and forth with this was. I knew Balls Mahoney was a capable wrestler in his own right, but of course he's better known for the chair swinging stuff, and we got a bit of that in this matchup, but he got to show off more of his actual technique in here, which made both guys look good ultimately. I think that uh, it was the least likely main event you could have expected for an ECW pay-per-view. Not usually what you think of when you think of ECW main event and I honestly would have switched this with the world title match, the three-way dance, instead, but that's just me. My grade for ECW Anarchy Rules 99 is a B+. It's a very fun show, and honestly, for a sub-three-hour show, it does seem to go by pretty quickly. I went into this thing 
with no preconceived notions of what to expect outside of the world title match, but you had a lot of the madness of what made ECW so fun and special at the time. You had your technical wrestling, you had your hardcore stuff, and almost every segment had some kind of surprise or twist or kind of like changing the script and going with something, something new and different. And surprisingly, most of those surprises actually paid off in a positive way and made for some good product as well. A couple things on the show I didn't really care for, like the tag title match, if you want to call it that, or like whatever that stuff was, like Simon Diamond and Chris Chetty and Jazz and Tom Marquez and New Jack and all that stuff. But even those segments had like a kind of a fun charm in their own way. And so, yeah, overall, a very entertaining show. But how are our ECW friends in the Invasion doing? Guys like RVD and Taz and Raven and Tajiri and Tommy Dreamer. How are those guys all doing as the Invasion rolls along? We're going to find out in two weeks when I review No Mercy 2001. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.